I'm Elizabeth Ann Atkins, and I'm so excited to welcome you here today with Mort Meisner. He is the latest author to be published by Two Sisters Writing and Publishing, and his book is a blockbuster waiting to happen because it's called Enough to be Dangerous, and Mort talks about his amazing life, overcoming tremendous odds, some of which were tra quite tragic, some of which could have crushed people in their tracks, but he survived, he lived to tell about it, and he's also got powerful insights about newsroom management, newsroom news coverage, racism, sexism, and a vision for a better future. So I want to welcome you here, Mort. <laughs> Thank you. You know, and I, I so believe in the book and the title that I have tattooed it on my chest, Enough to be Dangerous. What? So I'm, I'm living and I'm going to die with this. <laughs> well, it's your story. And we always advocate that everybody should write their story down, whether they publish it or not. It's your legacy. And your legacy is extremely impressive. And I yeah. want to start by just talking about why you decided to write a book. Yeah. So it's something I've thought about for about a decade. And at first... I told myself it's to be able to leave a legacy of some sort. But then as I got more in touch with my feelings about the past and present and what I want in the future, I thought by giving insight and real insight to the inside workings of the television news industry, uh, rock and roll, and also what it's like to grow up in a physically abusive household and the incredible toll it's taken on my life, I thought perhaps could help others. Absolutely. And that's why I did it. Absolutely, absolutely. We're gonna dive into each of those areas. Um, I first wanna say this is so unique because we're coming full circle. Mort actually hired me for my first TV news job at Fox 2 News, which was CBS at the time. And now here he came to us with his book to publish. So this is really exciting and just a long-term wonderful relationship. Um, I just didn't think the world of you and you have so much to offer with your insights. So I want to dive into the newsroom experience. Sure. Um, you have been a newsroom leader, manager, in three major American cities, and you witnessed some things about race and sexism that um, are pretty deplorable. And now during the Black Lives Matter movement and the Me Too, Me Too movement, people are trying to find solutions to these problems. But can you take us back a few decades and tell us some of the things that you witnessed? Well, sure. And, and again, it, it, it's such an honor to be with you because when I did hire you, I knew that stardom awaited because you're so smart, so witty, and a wonderful person inside and out, truly your mother's daughter. Thank you, Mark. Thank you're, you so you're much. You're so welcome. Yeah, I, I, I saw a lot. I mean, first on the uh, negative side of race, one of, you know, one of the things back in the late 70s and early 80s, it became more and more common to have a African-American, or as they said back then, Afro-American, and some people even disgustingly to me said colored person, um, uh, as the co-anchor as the female to the male. You know, in, uh, in Detroit, you had Doris Bisco with Bill Bonds. You had Linda Wright Avery with uh, another anchor here in Detroit, a white male anchor. Uh, and uh, Dana Eubanks with Bill at Channel 7. And I saw it over and over again. And the way management talked behind closed doors, they were very clear. There was, there was nothing unclear about it, that they were very resistant to putting a black male in uh, because they would use terms like, well, they have bigger chips on their shoulders. And also because women in our industry, historically, but incorrectly, were seen as not as smart, not as well read, uh, whether they were white or black. So by putting in a black female as eye candy, 
management felt like it satisfied a need. But if you go back to that time, how many black males were there front and center? Uh Uh-uh, not many. Not many in any market. And um, and that that was a big problem. And and on the sexist front, I mean, when I was working at CBS in Chicago, um, I remember my boss, and we talk about this in the book, uh, refused to hire a female as an executive producer because one, he said, I won't be able to swear in front of her, and two. I really think women should be like my wife at home, raising kids and preparing dinner. He eventually hired this woman and um, uh, it, it caused a lot of issues because I was reminded frequently by him that we shouldn't have hired her. And I saw this over and over and over again, and it was deplorable and, and, as a young manager and then as an older manager, I did everything I could to change it. Uh, in one case, I got fired over it because I went all the way to corporate to complain about uh, comments about blacks, women, and gay men, and the reward was being fired. Wow. 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 So during your several decades long career in TV news, did you notice any improvements? And if not, what's the solution moving forward? I did see improvements over the years, um, for example, but it was challenging. And I, I, I like to think that I was front and center trying to help make some of these improvements. I had a gentleman that worked with me Um, reported to me in Chicago at CBS. His name was Burley Hines. He's now passed away. When I inherited him as an underling, I noticed based in our meetings each day that he was assigned by others, quote, stories Burley could handle, end quote. Um, Things that weren't complicated. feature stories. And I thought it sucked. And I, I felt that uh, Burley was uh, a talented guy, not hard, you know, not hardly our best reporter, but wasn't our weakest either. And I brought him into my, uh, brought him over to my desk because I didn't really have an office per se. And I asked him, I said, how does it feel to be the garbage man? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, they treat you like a garbage man here. And I'm part of that team. I want to change it because I don't think you're a garbage man. I think you have a lot to bring. And so what we're going to do, I want to challenge you. I want to start making sure that you're assigned your share of harder news stories because I think you can deliver. Now, um, Oddly, in a way, he wasn't insulted. He sat there nodding his head, and he actually thanked me. And um, uh, we had a great relationship for the, um, this was about a month after I started there. We had a great relationship after that until I left and went to ABC. And just by the way, for what it's worth, this is a man who was married to a white female And I bring that up just sort of to paint a picture of who he was. Um, In St. Louis, I had a young man who sadly has now passed away. He was one of my best friends, John Noel. Mm. And he was another guy that um, when I inherited him in St. Louis, there wasn't a lot he did well other than coming to work on time and, um, and eating well. And I told him he had six months to get over my chinning bar. Otherwise, no matter how much I liked him and no matter how uh, punctual he was, uh, that I would fire him unless he got better. And he worked his ass off. Uh He got better. When I came to Detroit to run WJBK, 
CBS and then Fox, I brought him. Mm -hmm. And then when I left and became an agent, he entrusted me to help him fulfill a dream. Mm -hmm. And that was to work in New York, mm -hmm. his hometown. And I got him that job at WNBC. And one of only a few reporters I ever worked with without a contract. Wow. Uh, I said, John wanted to sign a contract. And I said, Johnny, I used to nickname him Johnny Christmas, John Noel. I said, Johnny, <laughs> listen, I don't need a contract with you. Mm -hmm. If you and I need it, unless you want one. I said, if you and I feel we need a contract, we probably shouldn't even work together. And we mm -hmm. did everything on a handshake until his dying breath on his deathbed. Mm -hmm. And um, John became an outstanding reporter because he was given the chance. Yes, yes. Listen, I love John. There are people, white, black, brown, whatever, who are not good reporters. And no amount of chances are ever going to help them. But then there are people that are uh, denied opportunities. Um, I did the same thing here in Detroit with Al Allen, who I thought wasn't treated well. I love Al. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Al, Al was uh, sometimes led the newscast more often than time he didn't, but he went from becoming, you know, whatever, sort of average to much better. So he... He accomplished a lot. He had a lot of pride. And I will say Al Allen, one of the nicest men I've met uh, during my time in the industry. And we actually, Mark, we actually published his book. It's called We're Standing By. So, oh, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. You know, I love that. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> but it's still a problem in yeah. the industry. Mm -hmm. I invite you to look at network news, mm -hmm. CNN. Who is front and center in black? Who's front and center at Fox? Who's front and center at ABC? Who's front and center at CBS? Lester Holt is front and center at NBC, deservedly so. Mm -hmm. But we got to do better with mm -hmm. men and women of color. Mm -hmm. You know, there is sometimes a flavor of the week that we're guilty of. And as I look at networks right now around the country, the current flavor of the week are Indian females. They're oh. popping up everywhere. Uh -huh. well, where were they five years ago? They were there, opportunity denied. So what's behind that? Um, I'll tell you what's behind it. Our industry continues to be run, and I say this generically, by fat, bald, white men uh, who are making the decisions and very often don't have friends of color. By the way, the generic fat, bald white men could apply to white women too. People of color uh, have not proliferated in terms of being uh, top dogs in our industry. I had a, I had a, a, a great uh, conversation with a, a good friend who was promoted at NBC two weeks ago, his name is Anzio Williams. Brilliant man. He's been uh, running a Philadelphia st station at NBC for a while. He's now head of diversity for NBC. Mm -hmm. Great move. Mm -hmm. He's deserving. He's going to mm -hmm. do a great job. Mm -hmm. And I applaud NBC. And I applaud any network that's doing it. Mm -hmm. Why so not? Why wait? Why did we wait? Well, that's what I want to ask you. What are the barriers that are blocking people of color and women to take those leadership behind the camera roles who make the major decisions about who does get on camera and what's covered and how it's covered? Management will say, and I used to be, I was gullible for 15 minutes in my life. Management used to say, well, the thing is, black men just want to anchor. They don't want to report. They don't want to be management. They just want to anchor. That's BS. I, I, I just think there was, there was a resistance by those at the top to uh, 
uh, put in minorities in these key situations. I once heard a manager of mine say about a black man that worked for us in Chicago, if he doesn't work out, we'll never be able to fire him. He's black. Actually, they said he's Afro-American. So when you have that mindset, I mean, it's defeatist, it's wrong, and it's racist. And I can't, I don't run newsrooms anymore. I'm on the other side. But certainly, I'm very deeply inside of the industry. And I think there is still some of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had a manager that once said to me about gay men. I don't mind having a gay man or two in the newsroom, but I don't want a newsroom full of fags. And that was in 1998, two decades ago. But this was someone running a major owned and operated station. Fortunately, he's out of the business. So the barriers created are often created by those um, uh, in charge of watching the hen house. Mm -hmm. So in today's world, 2020, Black Lives Matter movement, Me Too movement, people are looking to not only identify the problems and the root causes, but what are the solutions moving forward? And now you as an agent are in a position of power to help place people of color and women into those on camera roles. So what, what's your strategy or vision for that, Mort? People like Anzio Williams at NBC mm -hmm. becoming mm -hmm. head of diversity. And he said to me last week, he, he's an old friend, I'm gonna go to every NBC <laughs> station that they own and uh, see who's cutting the mustard and who isn't. And I'm gonna recommend on the who isn't, we make changes, no matter what color they are, no matter what nationality. I think we need uh, more people like Anzio. We need more enlightened people who look like me, white people. We need more women. And um, those things will uh, assist in affecting the kind of changes that we need. By the way, because I talked about CNN, CNN's doing a great job on field reporters. Mm -hmm. Great job. They have mm -hmm. some outstanding people. Mm -hmm. And even they've brought in uh, Abby Phillip, who is a better reporter than she is anchor, but they bring her in to sit on set and debrief her. So they're, I can see they're trying to raise her profile. I give them credit for doing that. But we need people in prime time uh, situations. You know, Don Lemon's on at 10 o'clock, CNN. 10 o'clock's getting a little late. I'm talking about 6A to 10P. And again, CNN gets a lot of credit for what they've done with their field reporters. I don't know what they've done with management. But I, I, I'd like to see at CNN and the other major networks more minorities. CBS does a good job in the mornings on the weekdays, as does ABC with Michael and Robin, and really as does NBC. But I'm talking about also some of the later day parts. Is your praise for CNN in that they have diversified their field reporter teams? Yeah. Yeah, okay. they have. And, and uh -huh. you know, uh, with a whole variety of minorities, whether they're Asian, uh, Black, uh, Indian. And I say that because we need to hire people in our industry who reflect the diversity of the audience. Yes, absolutely. Imagine, and cover it with sensitivity. I'm, I'm in Detroit today where I live. Mm -hmm. There was a point where 75% of the city was black mm -hmm. and 80% of the police force was white. Mm -hmm. What was wrong with that picture? Happily, yeah, big time. Coleman Young changed that. Yes, thankfully, thankfully. So excellent points, Mort. Very powerful. And I hope that, you know, we can continue to make the kind of progress that CNN is demonstrating yeah. and that Agreed. NBC is showcasing. 
So I want to talk also about some of the driving elements of what makes you who you are. And survival is one of those. You uh, grew up in a Detroit neighborhood during the civil rights movement. So you witnessed racism against black people. You witnessed racism <clears throat> against Jewish people, including an attack on your mother when you were little. Yeah. Um, so you grew up in a very turbulent time and it wasn't even safe at home because your father was physically abusive to you and your mother was abusive as well. So tell us, how did you survive that mentally, Mort? And how did you heal those wounds or did you? I haven't healed the wounds. You know, it was 1960. My mother took me to school for uh, first grade, first day of school. And some, quote, colored kids, as they were called, were bussed into my school at Fankel and Myers, Edgar Guest School. They had gone to McCarroll School in Detroit, which had a fire, so they had no place to go to school. So as they bust them in, I'm standing on the corner of Fenkel and Myers at whatever time, eight o'clock in the morning, and three buses of boys and girls. As far as I'm concerned, they were just boys and girls. I didn't think about the color. As they got off the bus, parents, parents started yelling, I don't, I don't say the N-word, so I'll just say, N-word, go home. N-word, go to your own school. And then a rock busted a little boy in the face, hit him in his glasses, and he was bleeding. He became a friend. Later. His name was Gregory Poindexter. I still remember him. And I remember during the attacks on these kids, I was crying. My mother was crying. She whisked me out of the crowd, and we went across the street to an A&W, which was also open for breakfast. And we sat in there, and I had a, a root beer and a coney dog. Well, there was a riot going there was a riot going on over kids getting an education and when i went home that night i asked my father who had been very physically abusive more so to my brother but to me as well dad what's an n-word and he punched me in the mouth punch me says, don't ever say that goddamn word again. Two years later, I asked what the F word meant. Punch me in the mouth again. So you know what? I learned to quit asking questions. As for my mother, you know, she could be pretty physically and mentally abusive, saying things like, you're not my little boy. I hate you. I... I wish you were never born. But one day we we're on 1961. She's walking me home from school, from the same school. And these, no other way to put it, white trash, uh, four guys lived in back of us, all of them, on Manor Street in Detroit, attacked her, knocked her down, kicked her, her false teeth came out on the ground. She was clutching her purse like they wanted her purse. They didn't need her purse. They were trying to beat the crap out of her and send a message. Well, my brother, who was a senior in high school, so this must have been 1960, as opposed to 61, later the same year, <laughs> Uh, came upon this and oh, he was a tough guy. He wiped the ground with all of them. But I still remember 
Dirty Jew, Kike. So I went from the craziness on the street to the craziness of my house. I mean, I endured multiple evictions because my parents couldn't pay the bills. One time evicted on Thanksgiving Day, 1963, days after John Kennedy was assassinated. Sat on my lawn in Oak Park, eating beanie weenies out of a can. I thought it was fun at the time, but I look back, it was, it was anything but fun. And, and where I lived in Oak Park was known as a cardboard village. And if you live there, kids at Oak Park High and the junior high, they made fun of you, particularly the girls. So I, this is tough, not as tough as some have had it. I'm not black in America. I can't imagine anything more difficult, even now, being black in America. We have men and women with modern day lynchings in their homes, on the street. So things are better in some ways, but they're sure as hell not better in others. You know, the children, the adult children of Viola Liuzzo, the only white civil rights worker to be murdered during the movement up until 1965, they've been friends of mine over the years. And sometimes when I feel down and maybe I'll go there today, I go to the park dedicated to her near Eight Mile in Greenfield. And I talk to the plaque and I say, I, I'll never believe you died for nothing. She left those kids and a husband and she and others, black and white in many cases, never got their proper due. So I'm not comparing my struggles to them. It's just that I, I had different struggles. I mean, I, I struggled with cocaine for seven years, 1981 to, to 1989. And it's only through God's grace that after that last line, October 19th, 1989, I lost my desire to use it. Let's talk about that because a lot of times people use alcohol and drugs to self-medicate the kinds of pain that don't leave physical scars, but surely your heart and soul were scarred by what you had endured at home. So talk about how that, you know, you know also it was an era when drugs were cool and drugs were everywhere. So the stigma that we have for cocaine use today is was not there. It was Vogue. It was the, you know, Studio 54 era, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In fact, Jody Powell, who was Jimmy, President Jimmy Carter's chief of staff, I remember one time in an interview with either Life or Time, one of those, extolled the virtues of cocaine being a safe recreational drug. Oh, my gosh. Thought. I'm not going to do a cop-out and say I deliberately did it to self-medicate because that would, it would be a cop-out. Mm -hmm. What I know is it was available and it made me feel good. And mm -hmm. to quote John Lennon, it's the only drug that no matter how much you did, you wanted more. Wow. And even Elton John, who I had the pleasure of promoting as a concert promoter, he talks about his first experience, vomiting, bloody nose, and then give me more. So oh my gosh. it's an insidious drug that I couldn't stop using until I made a decision to stop. And happily, it's 31 years. I mean, that's a miracle. And I, I say to people, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Congratulations. Yeah, so, so for anybody who might be out there struggling with it, what happened? How did you stop? Real simple. I mean, fear stopped me, but fear will not keep you from re-engaging. Fear stopped me because one night I had a pain in my arm 
after snorting a bunch of coke and I thought I was having a heart attack. I wasn't, but I went to the hospital. They kept me for observation for a day. My best friend, who's also in recovery, flew in from Texas. I'm so privileged Jim Epperson wrote the foreword to my book. Mm -hmm. And the doctor said to me, you need to go to treatment. And Jim said, bullshit. All he needs is to get honest. Mm -hmm. Bubba, you got to get honest or you're going to die, is what he said to me. That was it. I, I went to meetings. I, I never did it again. And for those listening who say, yeah, but he drinks. I do drink moderately. I, 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 I went to a, a group that used to exist in Ann Arbor called Moderation Management who basically would look at your using or drinking patterns and share whether they thought you were uh, someone who was an addict or you had an ism or if you were an abuser. In any case, I missed having a glass of wine. And, and, and um, so probably since 1993, 94, I'm a very occasional drinker and, and happily I don't have a problem with it. Mm-hmm. I neither need it or don't need it either way. Mm-hmm. But there's help out there for everyone and, and uh, people inspired me to stay clean and uh, it's just what I, what I do. So Mort, that's the perfect segue as we conclude on a happy note here that your family is your number one inspiration. So can you talk about how they both inspired you to write the book and inspired you to change the actual fabric of your lifestyle? Yeah, this is a real simple, direct answer. I have three children. Jason, who's 38, Nicole, who is almost 28, and Mark, who's 27. Some years ago, Jason, who has a different mother than Mark, shared with Mark that I had had a cocaine problem. I didn't know he shared it. And it came to my attention that Mark was angry with me because I kept telling him over the years I never did drugs. I lied because I was told by someone in the treatment industry, it's the only lie you should tell your kids. So I did. Well, this came to my attention. And I felt awful, embarrassed, ashamed, guilty. So I called a family meeting, which I don't ever do. I've, I've called one family meeting in my life, and that was it. And I got my kids in there, minus Jason, because he lives out of state. But I told them what I did afterwards. And I told them I I had been lying, that I had had that problem, and I apologized and asked for forgiveness for lying all those years. And that I was gonna write a book. And now that they knew the book wasn't gonna be pretty, I was gonna tell stupid stories, sad stories, funny stories about what it's like to be a drug user. And as good a relationship as I had with Jason and Mark and Nicole, it's significantly better. They hugged me. They thanked me. And now I tell people, if a therapist or anyone says it's the one lie, it's okay to tell your kids, push back. Mm. Because there is... I should have told them before. I'm glad I did. And, you know, I've warned them about everything in the book. Look, I wasn't all that good at being all that bad. But there's a lot of things I did. I mean, I, I, I risked my life. I wasted a lot of money. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I was able to stop mm-hmm. and quit wreaking havoc and that carnage on my body. Mm. Wow, that's powerful. 
Well, I think your book, Enough to be Dangerous, is going to entertain, inspire, educate, and really motivate people to make some powerful changes in the world and in their lives. So I hope so. Yeah, I absolutely think so. It's coming out and October. Right now, and right now, right, it's available, mortmeisner.com, pre-order. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, on Amazon, October 1st. Um, mm -hmm. uh, talking, uh, ebook, hardcover, soft cover. Audiobook. And, uh, be honored yeah. by anyone that reads it or listens to what I have to say about it. And, and I would be remiss. If I, if I didn't share how grateful I am to be joined at the hip with you and your sister in this partnership, in this relationship, because it would not be there. And I thank Stephanie Roop, mm -hmm. who is my writer, and mm -hmm. she calls herself my angel writer. Mm -hmm. And she is an angel. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. It's, it's our privilege and honor, Mort. Um, we're really, really excited. And Two Sisters Writing and Publishing has started a virtual speakers agency so that if you're looking for someone like Mort to share his very powerful, tear-jerking story that will make you laugh when you read the book as well. So don't think it's a downer. It's got lots of really fun moments, especially when he talks about rock and roll. So there's oh, a perfect yeah. balance in there. Um, but our virtual speakers agency makes Mort available as a speaker to colleges, corporations, companies, organizations. If you're looking for somebody who's going to inspire and captivate with storytelling, Mort is your person. So please go to mortmeisner.com or you can go to <clears throat> twosisterswriting.com, pre-order the book and get your copy reserved uh, and you'll receive it after October 1st. That's the official yeah. launch date. Well, thank so, you. You're welcome, Mort. Thank you for joining me here today. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Beautiful. It's going to be Take a blockbuster. You too. Take care. Thank you. You're welcome.